we can start now. Uh, uh, hello everyone for the second session today of the PubMed. Uh, this session is titled Creative and Innovative Approaches to Publishing. Uh, and here we will explore some current writing practices in social sciences and humanities and some innovations and challenges in quality assessment of uh, the research in social science and humanities. Uh, today we have three presenters, three lecturers, uh, and all three presentations will be very much connected, which is understandable because they are all uh, stemming from the same project, Opera SP, Open Scholarly Communication in the European Research Area for Social Science and Humanities. And all three presenters today have a background in digital humanities, but their presentations are not limited to digital humanities only, but to the wider research in social science and humanities. Uh, we will start with uh, just a few notes on the way the, the session will be uh, organized. We will have uh, each uh, pres uh, presentation followed by a short question and uh, answer session, and then the uh, broader discussion at the end of the session. Uh, we will start with our first speaker today, uh, Maciej Maril from the Institute of Literary Research of Polish Academy of Sciences. Uh, he serves as a deputy director at uh, IBL PEN, and he is a founding head of the Digital Humanities Center there. Uh, he is very active in various uh, working groups uh, related to digital humanities, like the Daria Digital Methods and Practices Observatory Group, ELA eHumanities Working Group, Opera Score Group, uh, and he is currently also involved in research on in the cost action new exploratory phase in research on East European cultures of descent. And today he will start uh, the first uh, part of our session titled Form and Access to Pathways of Innovations in SSH Scholarly Communications. So please, Maciej, go forward with your presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Eva, for this uh, introduction, and, and uh, thank you so much for, for, for the chance to be here uh, with you and to, to presenting at this, uh, this event. So, um, as I said before, what I'm going to present is basically uh, within the framework of, um, of, of the project we just uh, finished of Opera SP. However, um, that's also a part of a kind of broader idea for um, continuous work within the Operas Consortium uh, uh, in an initiative uh, we call Operas Lab or Operas Innovation Lab, which basically aims at exploring current writing practices, uh, prototyping new solutions and proposing um, ideas for new uh, Operas uh, services. So the work um, I'm presenting today, and actually we are all presenting today, um, uh, we, we've kind of laid some fun foundations for the, um, for the uh, for the Opera's uh, lab. So um, what I'm we'll be talking about uh, today is, uh, is not my own uh, work uh, in the sense that uh, lots of people who are credited here in this on this slide were uh, contributing to this um, uh, to this project and this particular uh, task. And if you would like to find out more, uh, we have this lovely report out and uh, sadly, we are not meeting uh, on site because we even printed some copies that are waiting for better days uh, where we can distribute them. So for now, you can just help yourself to some PDFs and also some other reports uh, which are in our on our Zenodo community. So getting back to the uh, to the main topic, uh, so I will be uh, my presentation as, as I'm the first speaker here will also give you a brief sense of the methodology behind the studies we're uh, presenting today. Um, so uh, let's just start with the idea of how we understand scholarly writing and in, in this particular study we uh, we uh, try to understand it really broadly. So we basically um, uh, think of scholarly writing as practices regarding the communication of scholarly ideas focused on, but not limited to, practices, competences, frameworks, and tools crucial for creating scholarly work. So uh, we basically focus on pe how people wish to communicate 
and how uh, the tools or Opera services in the future may facilitate it. So uh, we look here mostly from, you know, from the perspective of authors, of researchers, and, and look at their needs in conveying um, their ideas to the audiences. So in the course of our uh, project, we, uh, we, uh, we, we had like a kind of three um, layers of analysis. We had literature review, case studies analysis, and interviews. And today I'll be speaking only about this last part because that's the that's where we we're getting the today's ideas uh, um, uh, from. So the interviews. So uh, um, it's important to 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 uh, uh, to to underline that uh, we conducted those interviews also in order to to get the impression of what people actually. Uh, think and what the community says. So it's basically that we base our services and our ideas for uh, future services on what is actually needed or what is missing, what are the obstacles. So that's the, uh, um, that's the idea behind it. So our workflow was pretty standard. We started with the preparation, so establishing our fields of interest, uh, developing an interview script. We conducted interviews, coded them uh, with um, MaxQDA software, and, uh, and uh, analyzed them. And we, we also used our uh, keywords I will present uh, in a second to that uh, kind of guided our uh, initial analysis. Uh, something about our interviewees. So basically, we, we, uh, we, we conducted conducted uh, um, finally 32 um, interviews with um, full transcripts. We had 33 interviewees. Uh, here's the breakdown. You see that disciplines, SSH disciplines represented are pretty broad. And this is also what we wanted. We wanted to have big coverage of uh, um, both in terms of disciplines and in terms of uh, career stage and geography. So we also um, spoke with people from uh, um, different uh, European countries. And um, also we had some participants from uh, the US. So the areas we look for, and again, you see it's pretty broad because we wanted to 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 um, to analyze uh, lots of um, uh, to cover lots of ground. So there, we we spoke about specificity of SSH writing processes, publishing processes, about innovation. What's the difference in between innovative and traditional genres? We spoke about open access, evaluation, research data, peer review practices, tools, collaborations, and audiences. So uh, this is a pretty broad uh, um, spectrum. The interview, each interview lasted. For, our, for around an hour. And so today what you get, you, you get like three kind of uh, uh, snippets, uh, snapshots from, from, uh, from what we uh, uh, learned. Uh, so this is basically the word cloud of the most popular words in our uh, segments. It doesn't tell you much, but I'll give you some more uh, context in the second. So focusing on the topic, uh, of my uh, presentation today and getting back to the gist. So what is innovation? So um, we asked uh, our participants pretty early in the, in, in the interview to define innovation in scholarly um, communication. And uh, interestingly, uh, they, uh, of course, in, in the title of my, proposal, of my um, uh, paper, you already know the, the two basic answers that they were spoke about it in terms of either formal innovation or the access, but uh, more broadly, they, they picture it as the uh, act activity of experimenting in order to find a better way of doing something. So in this case, uh, experimenting to find a better way of conveying their message, of connecting with audiences, of, of, of getting their idea uh, through. So um, when they spoke and, and, and what, uh, what, I, what I have here are, are basically um, uh, um, some thoughts taken from the interviews. They were also talking about how um, innovation is, is about unsettling the way things have been. Uh, they provide room, it provides room for improvement in novel novelty. And um, uh, innovation is about using scholarly content seamlessly by, without uh, unnecessary obstacles. So it's basically using the technology which is available for the uh, for to improve uh, the um, the um, scholarly uh, communication. And and this quote is, is is pretty telling of this. This is a quote from one participant. Um, so um, I think these days it's the changes that have to do with the internet being the main platform for our communication. So it's much easier to share things now. And so I think that innovation basically means catching up with opportunities that technology offers. So in general, innovation is seen as a chance to improve the sharing of the ideas with the audiences, 
thanks to the novel technology. And of course, the, in this sense, uh, our participants were thinking that, okay, technology allows us to do so many things. So why aren't we doing them? Why aren't we um, have, taking all the advantage of how the knowledge could be uh, shared? So, and this was basically uh, the gist of, uh, of their thinking about innovation. So getting to those two types uh, uh, of innovation. So innovation is understood either in terms of form, so novel means of communicating the ideas or access, that is, accessing content or reaching new audiences. So um, we could risk the hypothesis here that what scholars consider innovative depends on the horizon of possibilities they see thanks to their experience, needs, and the types of sources they deal with in their research. Hence, researchers uh, who are more engaged with digital methods tend to consider innovation in formal terms, while the others who are not so much tech savvy uh, focus on access and reaching uh, audiences. And, and again, here an, an interesting uh, quote. I think that innovation comes in a number of ways. One is innovation uh, and ac of access, and so moving beyond the model of the paywall or moving beyond the model of subscriptions to get scholarship out there. Two, there is innovation in terms of modes of scholarly output, incorporating images, incorporating websites, etc., into scholarly output. So we see this, uh, those two modes of thinking. So let's start with access. And again, uh, a quote from the participant, I see the most innovation has been done in the area of the distribution of scholarly work and sharing scholarly work, either between people or between machines. That part is actually pretty innovative compared to previous phases or stages of scholarly communication. So access is considered a kind of the most tangible innovation. So something all the scholars can see that thanks to technology, we have, uh, um, uh, we have um, digital, outputs out there and we can uh, and access them. But also what's interesting, they think of it in terms of providing access to traditional outputs, you know, like uh, books, articles and PDFs, uh, reports, uh, things like uh, that. And this, what's also interesting about this uh, type of innovation is usually described in kind of negative terms. So, you know, removing some of the obstacles rather than providing something really new. And of course, it's also about accessing um, content through non paywall resources, repositories, or shadow libraries. So there was like one researcher, for instance, that, who said that in, he uses shadow libraries because he can access whatever he needs at this moment in his research. And this seamless access is something of, of huge value uh, for, uh, for him. Uh, and finally, in terms of access, just, just this little bit, I'm not going to get so much deeper into that, but uh, also um, many uh, researchers uh, spoke about data in this context. And in, in SSH, there's a growing need to uh, publish research data, uh, which uh, um, accompany some, some works or, or, or separately. So again, there are some limitations and obstacles uh, which, which are to be overcome. But the fact of publishing research data is also considered um, an innovation. So moving to the uh, um, to the uh, to the novel format, so innovation of form. So first of all, it should be stressed at the very beginning that what is meant here is uh, kind of more advanced forms of like kind of digital writing, not simply you know digital recreations of traditional genres like you know ebook, uh, which is you know just uh, uh, the book but in the digital uh, format. So it's more like uh, um, the fact that innovation becomes a part of the entire research workflow and is innovative um, the forms are used to communicate uh, various stages of the research so you know like data text linking data and text about which we what we can hear in a second but basically and really interestingly in this quote i'm, I'm sharing here is that it's also put in the kind of evolu evolutionary perspective. So innovation is not a rupture, it's not a revolution. It's, it's basically something that happens over time. And now when we have new technology, we can actually adapt the means of uh, scholarly um, communication we're using. We can adapt them to the technological affordances that are available out there. Uh, so uh, what are the formal innovations pointed out by our uh, interviews? And I just closed the window, sorry. 
Um, so first of all, um, allowing new types of interaction with text. So, so something that we can actually not only read it, we can browse it, we can execute it, we can use code, for instance. So something that text becomes more flexible, more interactive for the, uh, for the reader. Uh, secondly, linking text and source material, be it code or data. But that was a really uh, um, uh, recurring um, uh, topic that uh, the availability, you know, uh, that back before the digital um, media, we, we had footnotes who can direct you to the uh, um, to some sources used for the paper, which are somewhere in the archive or something like this. In this case, when we can actually uh, publish the data, uh, why not link them together to, to, get, to get a kind of meaningful experience for scholars? So this is the idea behind this, uh, this, uh, this innovation. Um, incorporating uh, other types of content, you know, like media pictures, video clips, etc or moving beyond the mere written work. So accepting expression of other media forms as basically valid scholarly outputs. So not only scientific article, but other uh, formats should be considered uh, proper uh, scholarly uh, works. So what are the consequences there? So we're talking about like what's, and again, remember that we're talking about what scholars think uh, in innovation is and what they want to use, what they want to uh, do. Um, so for them, the consequences are two that we have to keep in mind. So first of all, uh, um, by, the, by means of this, this innovation, we may allow access to the underlying content of research for you know, validation, replication, further interaction. So in this case, by, for instance, uh, connecting source material to text, we can uh, invite uh, those new kinds of reading, uh, we, um, which uh, deal with, um, uh, with more than just a set in the article, but can go to the data, can go to the code, etc. cetera. Uh, secondly, providing novel level of interaction with content which is impossible in static text. So um, in other words, we basically uh, can, uh, um, can explore them. Um, the text also can be updated, et cetera. So basically uh, we can uh, use technology to upgrade the way in which we uh, communicate. So asked about uh, what innovative forms they see or they, they can, um, uh, they can name, uh, we have those several ideas here. You see ranging from uh, uh, from kind of more or less formal ways of uh, communicating like blogs to some uh, um, social media um, content, um, um, video slides, like gray literature. Um, but probably most importantly, uh, uh, we can see here this uh, this thing which was named in uh, in various terms but meant more or less the same thing so we still have web book computational essay or a living book so this kind of interactive uh, interactive mode of writing that would enable um uh, researchers um, uh, sorry readers to 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 um to interact with the research uh, uh, content um, similarly we have a digital scholarly edition of collaborative text so these are all those genres and uh, uh, of course we don't have time to to uh, to dive into them here but of course in the report i mentioned in the beginning we dedicate a bit more place to them. Uh, today, I just want to, uh, to, to, to uh, share before I, I finish the, uh, those ideas on the computational essay and, and how it's kind of perceived by, the, uh, by our uh, scholars. So um, it's about, again, this link between data and text, but it's not so much about you know, just providing the data, but rather linking them with the outputs in a dynamic, interactive, meaningful way, allowing readers to engage with the scholarship at a deeper level. So uh, just I'm just reading this uh, quote now. So you've written some research in a programming notebook, and not only have you done that, but you provide it in a format that also leverages that functionality. So for example, people can see that there is a parameter in an experiment that's been used to produce a graph, and they have a little checkbox that they can use to make the parameter vary and see the graph update. That sort of thing for me is innovative, not in terms of technology, because it's quite old. Actually, it's just that publishing systems don't use it. So a kind of simple thing like just having an uh, interactive graph is actually uh, what we are talking about here that, uh, that allows us to interact with the underlying uh, data. So finishing with uh, uh, 
with challenges and obstacles we can of course uh, we'll be working to uh, uh, to minimize uh, but it's 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 important to remember about them especially because uh, in the next two presentations we'll also touch upon them in one way or another so First of all, the lack of quality assessment mechanism for novel content. So uh, we can publish uh, uh, a great computational essay, but there are no uh, standardized ways of actually assessing uh, it as a scholarly output. Uh, secondly, lack of recognition of innovative forms of scholarly text. So even if it's assessed somehow, uh, the reward systems do not recognize, uh, many reward systems do not recognize uh, innovative uh, uh, writing. Uh, thirdly, and paradoxically, uh, the formats of the work influences the assessment of the quality of its content. We have um, researchers who spoke that, you know, they published digital scholarly edition, but only then when they took these digital editions to the printed form, it was recognized as a proper work, which is, of course, a bit absurd, but it shows us how we look through the lens of technology at the actual output. So we don't, don't look at the output, we look at how it's, uh, uh, what kind of format it is in, if it's a recognized format or not. And finally, scholars are afraid to experiment because they want to publish in prestigious venues, so which in turn results in a lower number of innovative works and low prestige because uh, they, they go for prestigious formats, prestigious venues, and this we have this kind of vicious circle. But this is something uh, um, the next speaker, Marta, will probably tell you a bit more about it. So uh, that's it from me for now. So uh, I welcome questions in the chat or in the Q&A, and I guess that in the end we'll have some time for discussion. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Maciej. Uh, this was very interesting, and I don't see at the moment there are no questions in the Q and A. There is one question, but it is related to the previous session, so we don't have to answer it. Uh, but if I may, um, uh, we have time for a small observation, and if I can uh, do it, and if you can comment on it, maybe uh, one thing that is. Um, visible and in from your presentation, but also as I took a little part in the research that you have done, so I know something about the material. Uh, it's some sort of a division among the research uh, community, uh, because when we talk about innovation in access and in form, uh, we meet two different kinds of frustration from the researchers. One is the frustration of the group that is actually uh, frustrated with the traditional forms and traditional framework, and they see themselves as someone who is innovator and who want to break free in this, and they are ahead of their time. And on the other hand, hand there are, there is a group who is frustrated with the with innovation coming from uh, uh, outside and uh, pressing them to, uh, to innovate and to um, uh, conform to the changes happening in the, uh, in the environment. So uh, this morning we talk a lot about regaining ownership of uh, research and scholarly communication uh, arena by the research community. So how to do it if we actually have diff so different and diverse research uh, groups within the, this community? So that's a bit difficult uh, to achieve. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I mean, of course, and it's uh, actually the question is an excellent question and a topic for an, <laughs> for another presentation, I guess. Even it's so 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 deep it goes. But uh, uh, just to go briefly from the perspective, and I, I guess other speakers will probably later also have something to say about that. But from my perspective and from this kind of, of innovative outputs, I think the main thing is to basically allow, I mean, or encourage. Uh, um, this innovation uh, in in uh, all research communities in various disciplines uh, by simply uh, uh, and again I'm probably crossing to the turf of the next speaker but also like thinking about uh, uh, review mechanisms or or or, uh, or thinking about the assessment so you know that you basically you're not uh, obliged to do something but if you do if you publish your data you get a, somehow some kind of reward or if you publish your output in an innovative way so instead of a book you produce like a multimedia monograph because it's a better way to convey your message or connect your text with your outputs with the data 
fine, you know, you just get the uh, reward for uh, for that, which doesn't mean that all the people should be obliged to do so, but it means that we should kind of encourage this sort of innovation because it's also, um, I guess, uh, it guess, uh, it may have also better, larger impact sometimes because it's a kind of producing the, um, the, uh, the scholarly text in a form which kind of corresponds with what we're actually having, you know, all, all um, other uh, sectors of culture. And we kind of getting used to, you know, to, to reading interactive texts, etc. So this is sort of the way of kind of making it happen and allowing different ways of thinking through uh, through those uh, texts. So that would be my uh, my uh, short answer to this uh, huge complicated problem. But uh, um, I, I'm, I'm sure that Marta and uh, Elizabeth will will um, uh, will tell you something more about uh, this issue in their presentations. Mm, yes, thank you. So let me just briefly introduce uh, our next speaker, Marta Blaszynska. Uh, she also comes from the IBL PAN, the uh, Polish uh, Institute for Literary Studies. Uh, she is their coordinator of the Digital Humanities Center and a senior open science officer. Uh, she has been recently involved in various projects like uh, already mentioned Opera Speed and Triple, also within the Operas Consortium, then the Shape ID project and Oberred. Uh, she is also together with our uh, next speaker, Erzabet Totsifra, uh, co-chair of the Daria Research Data Management Working Group. And today she will have a presentation uh, with this uh, very uh, catching and original title, <laughs> uh, catching the original intent of scholarly communication, transformation of audiences, power structures, and prestige. And please, Marta, uh, the speakers and the microphone is yours, so please go forward. Thank you, Eva, and hello, everybody. It's good to be here because last year we were in the middle of Opera SP project. And I had the pleasure of presenting our plan for doing the case studies within Opera SP. So in the end, it was an effort um, done uh, mainly coordinated by our colleague Agnieszka Szulińska from IBL PAN, but it's good to be here back and to tell you a bit about the results of our interviews. And ha ha ha, doesn't seem to want to, there we go. And I am in quite a comfortable position because Maciej already told you about the team that we had and uh, the methodology that we used and hinted at the areas of interest. But um, what I wanted to stress is that uh, all those areas of interest, they of course relate to each other. And I was thinking about what brings prestige audiences and power structures. So those three themes that I would like to bring you closer to today uh, together. And while it can be related to all of the other areas, I thought that choosing a publication type is something um, crucial where you have to consider the audiences, the prestige, as it turned out in the interviews, and also the power structures of the scholarly system uh, that we are um, functioning in. So the main question is what happens when an author who is a scholar is choosing the type, so the form, uh, something that Mati was uh, talking about, and the venue, so the place, the publisher or the journal for their next publication. And it's something that we discussed a lot with the interviewees. And in fact, uh, a lot of factors came out. So first of all, there are several layers of decision-making. So um, we have to decide as scholars if we want to publish in print or digital or par parallel, which is often possible, especially in case of journals, but also sometimes books whether to opt for open access. And this is the case, especially if it's paid open access by the author. And very much as it turned out, depends on whether or not um, we have a grant to cover that. And which format or genre to go for? Do I want to buy, uh, write a book? Do I want to write a journal article? What is the most relevant? And what are the factors that we need to consider when making those decisions? 
Um, are there several motives? Are there incentives uh, for choosing the form and venue? As, and as it turned out, um, in terms of choosing a publication type, like I said, there are a lot of factors. So one of them is whether um, a certain form is appropriate for what we want to write. And several scholars remarked that even if they know that the formal evaluation system will not go in their favor, if they believe that uh, a certain form will be useful, will be the most appropriate for what they want to say, they will go with that. I will not read the quotes, but I welcome you to read them. I will comment on the factors themselves. And in terms of community relevance, that was also a very big factor because um, especially smaller disciplines or uh, of specialists who are interested in the same academic topic, who are sharing the same interests, they knew where to go for and they knew where they would be reached by their intended audience, which is something related to the next point. So the fact that it needs to be discoverable, the place where you want to write, as it turned out from the interviews, and visible. It doesn't have to be discoverable for all. Uh, it's what was the main focus of uh, what people were saying was being discoverable for the people that you want uh, your, to read your paper. So especially for uh, those relevant academic communities. However, there are several other issues, of course. So the economy of publishing, something I mentioned. If there are APCs, um, do you have the money to cover them? If not, what do you do? Do you go for another open access place uh, venue? Or do you go in a completely different direction? Bibliometric indicators, especially for more senior scholars, uh, for more um, for the younger scholars, in fact, the more senior scholars, uh, they reported that they felt that they felt the freedom to move away from the bibliometric indicators, which was quite an interesting um, observation because they still usually encourage the younger colleagues to look at bibliometric indicators in order to advance in their careers. Publisher reputation was a huge uh, factor favoring open access overall, although it was usually not the most important um, issue to consider when choosing. And something quite often informal, so invitation by editors. Sometimes it was just um, the case of not looking where to publish, but being asked to do so. And importantly, what um, already has been mentioned, but should be remembered, I think, is there's a very different situation for early career and uh, senior uh, scholars. And um, this comes on a lot of levels. So uh, senior scholars, of course, get invited more by editors um, to publish in a certain place. They also, like I mentioned, feel they have more freedom uh, in choosing um, venues that are maybe, maybe slightly less recognized by formal evaluation assessments, but are considered important. Um, and in general, they feel they have more power in terms of uh, choosing uh, where and how to publish. And as you could have seen, maybe I'll just show for one more second, all those topics that I mentioned, they refer to, the, to those three themes uh, that I wanted to speak to you about. So they refer to the audience. So for example, the community and, uh, and the fact that it can be a discoverable text. This is thinking about the audience. They relate to prestige because you're thinking about the bibliometric indicators, but also the publisher reputation. And they refer to public, uh, to the power structures. So uh, invitation by editors, it doesn't happen to everyone, right? And also um, how powerful you are to make your own decisions or whether you have to follow certain procedures um, suggested to you by more senior colleagues. So I would like to speak about these in slightly more detail. So starting with audiences, thinking about an audience. So. One of the answers that uh, came up, um, as you can see on the slide, was that um, a scholarly text has no audience in mind. It's 
pure in a certain a way. But this was not the most common answer, I have to say. Uh, this is just something to tease us a little here, because most of the scholars reported uh, that they do think about audiences a lot, whether it's about their specialized small community or whether it's about reaching uh, a broader audience um, and uh, having some kind of social impact. There is usually something about audiences on their mind. And the questions we could look at is who are the audiences for scholarly outputs? So is a scholarly text, as we would traditionally say, for scholars by scholars? And this is also a quote from one of the interviews. And what are the incentives for actually expanding the circle of potential audiences outside of the usual suspects? Um, so three types of communities were um, mentioned as potential audiences of a scholarly output. First of all, scholarly communities. And it has to be said that even scholars who saw a lot of potential in expanding to the broader society still, of well, maybe, of course, maybe not, uh, thought that the scholarly text was aimed at scholarly communities, first of all. Then the professional communities. And what I mean here, it really depends on the SSH discipline that we're talking about, because there are, of course, a lot of varieties within uh, the SSH world. But it's just circles of professionals outside of scholars. So, for example, educational managers, NGOs, uh, people who are involved in research, but they're not academics, who could benefit from the research that has been conducted. So it depends very much to the topic of research as well. And if we're conducting a, a research project on a given issue that is uh, based in another branch of, um, of professional world, it's good to reach those communities. And then there's this third group, which is very general, of course, because it's society. So the assumption that our uh, interviewees had was not that everybody would read it or that it would be uh, reached by everyone and uh, would become a bestseller, but there was this idea of social impact that a lot of um, uh, scholars shared and also of the popularization activities. So uh, having certain bits of what we're doing for broader audiences who might be interested in finding out about um, our research. And so there is a certain increasing value of the audience outreach. Uh, so something related to this, related to the social impact. And this relates to the title of this talk. So some of the, um, of the scholars saw the potential of innovation in opening up research. So something that Maciej was relating to, but um, they also thought that in a way it was coming back to the original uh, mission of the scholarly work. So of reaching audiences, of reaching readers, but readers, uh, are not the only type of audience uh, that can be reached uh, within that. And this is related to the potential of innovative forms. So they saw that um, a lot of the forms that we saw in the previous presentation, so the digital uh, blogs, uh, social media, but also the more innovative uh, forms of slightly more uh, academic writing, such as living books or computational essays, they can um, reach new audiences and they have this um, more spreading um, power. Moving over to the um, idea of prestige, uh, which was also very important uh, when it came up to choosing the publication type and the venue. Uh, we didn't ask our uh, scholars what they thought prestige was, so had to kind of read between the lines. But what we saw is that the notion of prestige was generally uh, more general or more broad than strict bibliometrics or official evaluations, whether it's on national level or on institutional level. However, 
when it came to the prestige of publications and career advancement, especially in case of uh, early career scholars, uh, many decisions were made in strict consideration of the evaluation processes and of the prestige of the uh, publication venues that they were looking at. And what I wrote here, it sounds very uh, serious, so sometimes resulting with a move made against one's own values. What I meant here exactly was uh, that there were examples given by people who were uh, open uh, science and open access um, proponents. They were very much uh, excited by open access, but sometimes made decisions to go with closed access if it was with a prestigious journal or um, prestigious um, publisher who they knew would benefit their careers. And the prestige of a publication was linked to ideas of scarcity and trustworthiness. So scarcity meaning that if it's hard to publish somewhere, if only a certain percentage of people manage to get through to a given journal or publisher, it was becoming more prestigious in the scholar's eyes. And trustworthiness, it depended on a number of factors. So it depended on, um, again, publisher or journal, but also on who shared the information uh, to us about a certain publication. And this was especially the case if uh, a publication was uh, about a topic that the scholar was not very familiar with, then they trusted their uh, trusted colleagues uh, much more and they relied on them uh, in choosing what to read. The prestige of innovative forms was, in fact, unclear. So a lot of scholars recognized their importance. And um, it was often said that it's good that um, exciting new things are happening in social sciences and humanities. But even the innovators themselves and what we called innovators were the scholars who were trying those innovative um, forms and were kind of pioneers in their disciplines. Uh, they all referred to the problem of recognition. So those outputs are not evaluated often and uh, sometimes they don't count towards their careers. There were generally those um, quotes suggesting that, you know, I do the blogging, I do the tweeting, I do sharing knowledge, but I don't get recognized for that. What I get recognized for is traditional papers, is books, monographs, so still considered the king or queen of the SSH, as we can see here, and this was a um, thought that came up several times during the interviews. And the last of the three, so power structures, um, something that was recognized as an important thing within the field of scholarly communication uh, by most of our interviewees, uh, but when we asked about which group uh, holds the most power in the academic publishing landscape, the answers were different and often the answers were not clear. And this is not because, well, some, sometimes it was suggested that it's because we don't always know what goes on behind closed doors, which I think was a very powerful statement. But sometimes it was also because um, our interviewees recognize those groups as very interlinked. So editors, reviewers, scholars, funders, policymakers, they do not act alone. They are all part of the system. So it's hard to separate one group and say that they are uh, the most important of all or the most powerful within the system. Yet, there are two groups that I would like to mention, which are researchers themselves, which were mentioned as a group. And this is something Mati hinted at. So they were recognized as a group who could facilitate changes and who could either become gatekeepers of the old, so block innovations, or could encourage their colleagues um, to do more to try um, new things and experimenting with the form, for example, experimenting with, um, with the venues. And editors uh, were uh, regarded as a very important group because they were seen as the final decision makers in a lot of um, situations. 
What was mentioned again, it refers to what uh, we said before, early career researchers were defined as the most vulnerable, although it was sometimes said that uh, they are the most vulnerable because we keep talking about make, uh, they, we keep talking about how vulnerable they are. So uh, it's kind of like a vicious circle in which the early career researchers find themselves, whereas they should be the ones who um, often come with the open minds and could experiment with different um, innovations within um, their scholarly work. And this is an interesting point because uh, Mati mentioned that innovation was a um, um, slow process. Well, some of our, the scholars saw it as a small process that was gradually taking place. But um, also some others so indeed saw it as a disruption and they saw it as a challenge to the traditional structures, the traditional power structures within the system. Um, and an example was given of blogosphere, for example, where the audiences that are reached, that are larger audiences, they can become editors themselves and they are given more power than in the case of more traditional uh, publishing process. So the conclusion, um, just a few sentences really. So what we saw here is that those novel forms that Mati listed in his presentation presentation, they allow to reach new audiences and the enthusiasm for writing for non-specialist audiences varies. So there are scholars who are very excited about it and they see the mission of science as to spread the word, whereas some others see it as a cherry on top. So let's do scholarly work first and share it with our communities and then reach out if we feel the need. Um, while the prestige of innovative genres is unclear, many scholars see them as important and there is a pressing need uh, coming both from innovators, but also of those who are not innovators, but just see their colleagues efforts to, for recognition by official evaluation frameworks of those innovative works. And this is something that for sure Erzabet will talk more about. And there are strong power structures that are perceived by um, the scholars um, themselves. Uh, and there is a potential for them to be shifted or disrupted by digital outputs um, because of this wider involvement that I uh, referred to. So the possibility for the audience to interact, to get more involved um, in the process. And this is it from me. Thank you very much. And I welcome questions and comments. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Marta, so much. This was very interesting. And uh, yes, you probably didn't have time during your presentation to read the chat, but it was very, um, there was already a discussion uh, started uh, on two different uh, points. And if I uh, may suggest as a moderator, that I will leave the the discussion about the position of senior and younger scholars for for our final discussion, because I somehow see that uh, Erzabet's presentation could also give some uh, input into that uh, issue. But there was um, uh, the first comment from Tiana Vukic in the chat was also something uh, that you could comment, uh, and it uh, it is. Re um, uh, it is related to the different types of uh, writing uh, scholarly uh, scholarly results and to different kinds of reporting them uh, because uh, writing in a more popular or journalistic style can be challenging for scholars, uh, even for those who previously have been journalists, as Tiana mentioned. So this is something, and I remember also from one of the research that we were conducting in the Opera SP project that it was in one focus group, it was mentioned that the uh, researchers often expected their institution to help them actually in the activities of popularization of research, because they that is something that they do not always feel so comfortable and um, uh, competent in doing so. So can you comment on that issue? Oh, yes, of course. Again, it's a huge issue. So probably we could have a whole different discussion on this. 
But um, I think something that also came up in an event that we did in February, because we shared our preliminary results in February and we discussed some experts and uh, the audience to comment on them, is the issue of training. And it's something that I didn't um, come up with uh, in my presentation because there was just no time. But I think that there is possibility, of course, it's a huge challenge. I'm not saying that someone will learn in one quick workshop how to write for broader audiences. And also the wider social society is not a single group, right? There are different people. There are people who are passionate about certain humanities topics, especially some local topics where they can they could be better experts than academics themselves because they spend their free time collecting information and they would expect slightly more professional communication. There are people who are just slightly interested and they would like to know what's happening, but they would expect simpler language. So it's a very complex topic, but I think the issue of training is crucial here because the training as we suggested during this work in that workshop in February, could would not be necessarily a traditional training from senior researchers, for example, for younger researchers, but it could be done on many levels. So uh, there could be people within an institution or within a network of researchers who has who have a lot of experience in communication because they worked as PR managers before, then they moved to academia or they were journalists, uh, like it was mentioned, and they could share this knowledge. So uh, the question I can leave us with, which came up again in February, was who trains the trainers and what happens then? But um, of course, it's not an easy um, issue to tackle straight away. So I recognize that it's challenging, but it also, I think people learn with practice, possibly. They see what, uh, what can become um, useful or interesting for their audiences as they keep doing it. It's something that doesn't come straight away. Yes, thank you, Marta. And yes, we already have a suggestion to have a workshop on writing uh, for popular writing on the next, pub, next PubMed conference. Yeah, so, good idea. Okay, we can this uh, uh, continue the discussion about other issues later, but now we will go on with uh, Erzsebet's uh, presentation and I will shortly introduce Erzsebet. She also provided a very short and very modest uh, CV for the PubMed website, uh, which is something um, that probably should be made in more extensive way because Erzsebet Todd Sifra, uh, Open Science Officer uh, in Daria U, EU, is a person who is very, very active in the arena of open science and digital humanities. And uh, she has, uh, um, and besides uh, promoting open science practices, I have uh, witnessed that she is also a person who, um, who does what she preaches. So she, in her research, she always uh, acknowledges everything that has to be uh, done with respect to open science uh, principles. And today she will talk about, uh, mostly about peer review and about the challenges and changes in the peer review system that is present today and that is currently very much changing. So please, Erzsebet. Uh, continue with your presentation. Thanks a lot, Eva. A special thanks for this lovely, lovely introduction. I, I feel a little bit like almost too touched, and I think like uh, saying somebody's preaching what uh, uh, somebody's practicing what she's preaching is probably among the biggest compliments and alternative academics like me can get. But to the point. So. Um, let me start, let me like jump right into the middle with my talk. And let me start it with this, I think quite powerful lines borrowed from my colleague and bio professor of German studies. It reads, imagine if you were to stop being first and foremost a scholar for a little while in order to take a job in which you could do something that would be useful, not just to your personal career, 
uh, but to the whole scholarly community. What would be the focus? What would seem the most useful to you? And the lovely thing is that I think you already kind of started this shared thought exercise or even shared fantasizing in the chat. So please feel free to continue this while uh, I'm talking to you. So, um, so I think this clearly like this, what I really like in this statement because it clearly indicates the big problem with open science uh, that, that uh, can be considered really as the Achilles heel of its uh, implementation globally, that is the conflict between what counts for our career and what pushes forward scholarship, what's good for our scholarship, what's good for our career. So we find it truly important to bring this issue and work on it as part of the H2020 Opera SP project. Um, Maciej and Marta already told you everything um, about uh, our collaboration, which was uh, quite, a, quite an, uh, um, an enjoyable one. I, I have to stress that as well. And so we had a dedicated task force. Uh, we wanted to capture the realities of peer review in the social sciences and humanities discipline, because you know, this is usually something that is very difficult to study. It's operating in black boxes. And it's not that easy to get honest testimonies about how it works in a real actual practice. So we apply the same methodology as, uh, as, as um, in the writing innovation parts of the study. And what we really tried uh, is to keep this rich, very insightful polyphony unfolding from uh, those 32 anonymous and quite in-depth interviews or testimonies. So here are a couple of questions we wanted to better understand. Uh, how the notion of excellence and other peer review proxies are constructed, negotiated or renegotiated in, in, in SSH disciplines? Um, who is involved in the process and who is remaining outside, super important. Um, what are the boundaries of peer review in terms of inclusiveness with content types? And how are those processes are aligned or misaligned with research realities? And um, probably most importantly, what are the underlying reasons um, behind the persistence of certain proxies that is everyone knows that open peer review or more transparency in peer review is, 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 is a good thing? Why not people still doing that? So um, I think this vicious circle of um, peer review scholarly communication and research assessment uh, are naturally unfolding from Marta's presentation. So I'm not revealing uh, breaking news here to you. But so one of the reasons why it's super difficult to change peer review or research evaluation for the better is that because it's all deeply embedded in the broader system of academic power structures. Um, commonly referred to as to the prestige economy. So what you can see here is a vicious circle in which research evaluation is currently lingering. And as long as the research evaluation criteria is dominated by publisher prestige or bibliometrics of very established traditional content types of the research paper, then um, open research practices such as blogging or data sharing or sensitivity towards multilingualism or um, upscaling text analysis tools or doing databases and the like will remain strongly counter incentivized um, and will not grow sufficient enough to replace the current, form, the current harmful system. The evaluation culture around them will not grow sufficiently enough. So, it became very clear in our analysis that um, like the major challenges, although like Operas and Daria as our sister research infrastructure. So we were very concerned about the infrastructural preconditions of uh, innovation, innovating peer review, but it's all clear that the major challenges around peer review are much more social than technical. Um, so, the biggest issues are really along the, are along the line of the who, who are involved in gatekeeping and who remain out. So 
As active practitioners or scholarly communication expert, probably you are not surprised by the fact that the shortage or more precisely put, the looming crisis of evaluative labor turned out to be by far the biggest challenge in the system. Uh, and this defines probably all other aspects of how peer review is operating. So in the digital age, our printing and dissemin dissemination capacities are not finite anymore, but our attention is very much so. And here comes the big contrast. Um, contrary to this, administering and gaining recognition to peer reviewing activities is still barely existing in reality. Um, many reviewers uh, whom we were talking to said that they gain symbolic capital, symbolic recognitions from reviewing to prestigious uh, publication venues. But you know, the problem with this is that uh, it conservates existing power structures and make it harder for certain scholars, for certain content types to enter the game. And this situation, this shortage of evaluative labor gives editors really hard time to put any diversity measures in place. So in our studies, we found that there are huge issues in terms of, um, you know, uh, gender biases, geographical biases, language biases when it comes to peer review. But since editors who are really the gatekeepers in social sciences and humanities disciplines, much more than reviewers themselves, they are really uh, operating this big game. Um, but so they are already having hard times to find competent reviewers to the smaller disciplinary communities, you know, let alone put any diversity measures in place. So this is really difficult. Um, but interestingly, to say something positive uh, along the line of um, age and career levels, we also saw that this um, shortage of reviewers opens the door for young scholars to establish themselves as reviewers. But here again, um, it depends on where are you coming from, which networks, which institution uh, as an early career researcher. So of course, um, chances are not completely the same here. Um, working, on, working in small um, disciplinary communities um, also seem to define social sciences and humanities scholars' attitudes towards openness and transparency in peer review. And uh, what is interesting probably to the PubMed crowd is that here is the strongest divergence from um, from uh, what we see um, in the global open science um, ideas and, 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 and values regarding open peer review. So what we found that uh, social sciences and uh, humanities community priorities significantly differ from that. And we experienced a strong and, and quite complex, but at least not univocal resistance. Um, against uh, open peer review practices. So a recurrent argument uh, that we heard was that in a climate where it's already quite difficult to find reviewers um, who are doing their work voluntarily, expecting them to sign their signing their reviews and uh, bearing all the consequences uh, in terms of academic power hierarchy is quite a mission impossible. Um, but we know very well that uh, open peer review comes in many shapes and flavors, right? So um, it seems that publishing peer review texts anonymously uh, alongside the publications turn out to be the flavor of openness that was uh, enjoyed the most support, uh, even endorsement uh, from among our respondents. I really hope that my computer is not gonna be charging um, so in addition to the who and the how, we also wanted to learn about the what aspects. So the, chal the challenges uh, around the inclusivity potential of peer review in terms of content types. So I'm referring back to the chat discussion now. Um, and if you're working with digital and computational methods, 
I think you might be well aware of this pressing need to assess uh, born digital scholarship. Um, and that, that kind of things that cannot really be um, placed on a bookshelf. Um, so it's clear now that in order to, um, in order to gain recognition, formal recognition to these content types in, in research assessment and research administration, peer review frameworks need to be strengthened around them. Peer review seem to be an absolute precondition to this. Um, interestingly, that was quite exciting actually as a kind of a digital extension of the book reviews that have a long tradition in social science and humanities fields. Um, we've seen an emerging culture of post-publication tool and code reviews. Um, and these are usually the, dis the discourse spaces where discussions or even debates over how to accommodate the notion of reproducibility um, is happening in these fields. But here again, it's really difficult to find reviewers who are competent in all aspects of evaluating this uh, complex scholarly objects. Um, on the positive note, especially in the context of uh, this uh, novel born digital content types, it was really exciting to see that uh, the critical discourse around uh, this outputs um, is much more abundant, much more prevalent than what is channeled in uh, formal peer review discussions. Um, here you can find a little snippet, uh, like some wonderings or testimony about um, entertaining the idea of reproducibility in digital humanities. So hermeneutics are just too hard for artificial intelligence at this point in time. So what I definitely think is that given more people that are comfortable with using digital technology and code as, as a tool, we will see, and for example, the packages like R and statistic stuff, I think that people will generally, as part of their peer review activity, you know, do a few simple tests, maybe if the data is available, and they say that they did this in R and this is the data. Well, um, can I do the simplest thing um, if they did? And can I repeat that? And that already is a small step in that long journey. And in general, yes, I think there is definitely going to be a place in digital humanities and humanities research for increased usage of reproducing parts of the research that is reported on in the papers. Of course, we are not very good at this time in supporting that kind of reading. And he means that because it's quite resource intensive. So here is the vicious circle again. So to finish with something positive, um, in addition to pointing out current anomalies in how peer review operates in um, social science and humanities uh, everyday practices, we also wanted to know what drives scholars to voluntarily contribute uh, to this complex enterprise of peer review. So uh, here you can see the top incentives and what our respondents valued the most when it came to peer review. And the good news is that uh, none of them are really tied to any monetary or hierarchy aspects, but instead it seems that those are purely scholarly in nature, advancing one's field, whether I find a paper interesting enough, I will review that, whether it uh, fuels my curiosity, I will review that. Sometimes the invitation itself, it have, which has to do some sort of prestige, but not publisher prestige as such, um, the, 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 the network effect of being invited is an important, uh, um, important uh, incentive. Also, you know, this Hello, Elizabeth. I, I think we have some technical issues with uh, with Elizabeth's presentation. 
sorry to see that. I hope she will join us soon to finish this. But in the meantime, while we are waiting for her, we might start discussing the issues that we already have started in the chat. So uh, maybe I could ask uh, Marta and Macha, you have already answered. Uh, so we hope that she will connect again. Um, we have already, you have already started uh, answering and uh, adding your comments in the chat, yes. but. Oh, so you're here. Yes, sorry, uh, a small internet uh, problem. Okay, so, <laughs> so you can finish that. your presentation. So. Yes, there is not Please much left on. actually. So, okay. Uh, I just left a little bit of uh, suspense for you, <laughs> sorry for that. So we were talking about incentives uh, and uh, like network effects. And, you know, in many cases it really works like really works like uh, this this uh, favor banks uh like reciprocating uh favors to review in favor of reviewing um power and prestige issues are i also mentioned that um we found unfortunately that um scholars uh assuming that they would be gaining more capital from reviewing to prestigious journals also due to this sense of scarcity um they are more inclined to go to um traditional established high prestige publication venues and a uh, channel their reviewing efforts to these venues you can imagine its effect on innovative and emerging uh, scholarly venues and types um yeah and reciprocity we already discussed so it was really great to see once again that many of these like the majority of these incentives are purely scholarly in nature and i think um this is um this presence of collective scholarly sovereignty uh should neither be underestimated nor should we exploit it because if anything scholars really need to deserve and it really need, deserve to be recognized uh for this um activity so here you can find a couple of uh testimonies uh i would like to direct your attention to the second one what i like about this uh, is the editor actually identifying someone relevant to my work uh and, and uh based on what she read from she read from my book i mean the editor actually can categorize me this is really one of the values of peer reviews that i know I've been sent to reviewers who understand my work, which means my work is clear enough in order to be sent to the right reviewers. So it also highlights the value of the editorial work, which is also invisible, and the work of peer review and, and value. So let me finish with some future trends. Um, I think the, the major question is really how to build more evaluative capacity and how this pressing shortage of evaluative labor defines innovations. So increasing formal or informal recognition of reviewing work is an absolute priority. In this respect, we see that, especially in hard sciences, there are, um, there are initiatives to change this for the better, like problems, but as long as reviewing work is not recognized and now i'm referring back to this big vicious circle of um, of prestige economy as long as reviewing work is not um acknowledged and credited in formal research assessment um we could remain a little bit skeptical about grassroots initiatives like poblons um Another interesting trend that we, that we saw has to do with decoupling assessment from journals and publishers. Whether it's becoming a reality, we saw that uh, critical discussion uh, around scholarship in its full breadth is quite abundant in social media, in mailing lists, in focus groups, in informal conversations. Um, so how to build on them how to find ways to channel informal discourse spaces evaluation discourse spaces to more formal ones that's also uh, a second 
interesting uh, future direction. So I think it's time for me to end this presentation. If you want to read um, the, uh, our report as it is now, uh, you are very welcome to do that. I put the DOI here, but more importantly, uh, we are planning to, we have this ambitious, maybe over ambitious plan in mind to turn our reports into like we, together with the writing innovations uh, into an open access book in the near future. We'll see how it goes. Um, but if you just want to develop uh, some understanding on a very short time, then you can find uh, the summary of our findings uh, on, Zeno, uh, yeah, on Zenodo as well. And uh, here you can find the DOI. So thanks a lot for your attention and sorry again for the internet connection issue. It was kind of a Murphy. Thank you, uh, Elizabeth, so much. Uh, this was really very interesting and the whole session, I think, was really uh, engaging and I see that the, uh, we have a lot of uh, comments in the chat. So uh, thank you for also writing your uh, answers there. But if you might want to comment on some issues, I think that we have two um, probably uh, main obstacles uh, recognized within these comments. And I see them as lack of time. Uh, mm -hmm. This is one recurrent motive. And the other is the, this um, position of senior scientists who are in a position to change the system, but are maybe not always willing to do so and how to change that uh, effect. So uh, does any one of you want to comment more on that? Yes, Marta, please. Yes, I just wanted to reinforce what I wrote on the chat in case someone missed it, that also, and also clarify that um, I didn't want to sound like the senior scholars are always unwilling to help the, you know, that they're the, the evil gatekeepers of the system. Actually, what we found in the interviews was that a lot of times they advise their younger colleagues to publish in a journal that was very recognized by the community or whatever to do some traditional stuff out of care because they felt that um, their um, younger colleagues, younger in terms of career, of course, not necessarily age-wise, but that they needed some support, they needed some guidance. And I suggest, well, it's something that we should uh, look more deeply into maybe, but maybe there is not always this recognition of what came up in my presentation that one of the most powerful uh, drivers of change is the research community itself. So sometimes those senior uh, researchers were not feeling it that if they recognize the younger colleagues efforts, for example, that it could make a difference, especially if they were recognized people in the field. And um, so, yeah, I just wanted to clarify that I didn't think of them as uh, gatekeepers. Not always. It depended, of course. There, people have a lot of different ideas, but sometimes it was simply out of care, you know, just to ensure that they would uh, be able to advance a little. Yes, Elizabeth, please go. Yes, regarding the, the the generation issue, I find it super exciting. And sometimes I have the feeling that it's been changing a lot, even during those past couple of years, uh, I'm actively working um, in the field of open science advocacy. But I think the really um, challenging issue here, and probably this was reflected also in our interviews, is um, it's a matter of socialization. So when senior scholars, uh, when we feel, when you have the impression that senior scholars are not fully committed to, to open the idea of openness and transparency and the like, I think in many cases, it's not because um, they explicitly discard these ideas, but it's because they had been implicitly socialized in certain ways and uh, many and 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 we are human beings we don't always have the capacity to reflect and and develop a, a tight awareness of how we have been socialized to tell you a very 
personal example that I maybe shouldn't share, but I still remember when I got my first invitation to do an open peer review for an MDPA journal, which I did, you can read it. And I remember have start, like having started writing the, the review text completely the same way as I'd been reviewed previously as an author. You know, it was a similar kind of epiphany when you uh, uncomfortably recognize that you're repeating your father's words in a parenting situation. It was like, who, who, who are these people talking from my review? And I had to rethink, I am maybe like a, like a review can be written uh, much more kindly, much in a much more constructive manner. And, and, and uh, we have our chances to break down this, these patterns, but still, even in my case, at the beginning, it was a very, I think like a practice or an attitude very automatically done because simply because this is how I've been socialized as a scholar. This is how I've been reviewed, you know, and these patterns are getting inherited and passed on to generations without necessarily raising awareness of them. Yes, thank you for sharing this. This is very uh, illuminating of the way the system works, actually. It doesn't always have to, but it usually does. So yes, Maciej, uh, let us hear your opinion. Also. Yes, so I would just, uh, thanks uh, uh, as a kind of like this, this last comment. So I would just also direct you to the other, um, in the other direction as well. So when we are just talking, what could be uh, done, and I mean, of course, I agree with uh, with what um, Martin Shabet said, uh, um, uh, and the fact that, of course, any change, you know, whenever it's slow, it takes time. If if it has to be systemic, because we are talking about like systemic changes, we, there's like lots of uh, um, in, in intermingled interests here. Um, but uh, what we can do, for instance, as, as as scholars, basically, is also kind of encourage our um, colleagues in our teams actually to do uh, um, to do this uh, um, uh, this work and to actually use the outputs they of course uh, uh, see fit best to their um, to their um, work. So this is like what we're trying to do also in the project. You just mentioned, of course, we want to also end up with a book which would be an open access book. But still, all our outputs, uh, our data is available. Our um, reports uh, which are a bit bulky, but still they are available and they were reviewed internally. So it's not like you know, kind of vanity <laughs> publishing, but they were uh, there are like parts of scholarly work. So what I'm getting at is that we, as kind of team leaders, uh, institutional leaders, etc., we also should encourage basically this kind of attitude. Not so much the fact that you just need to to go to the um, prestigious venues, but you need to kind of use uh, proper means of communicating your own research. And so that would be my kind of uh, takeaway message, I guess. Okay. Oh. Thank you. It's a great message for, uh, for the end of the session. Thank you very much for being here, uh, for uh, discussing with us these issues. And uh, I will just finish with uh, saying that um, although the project is over, the work on this issue is not over and uh, many more activities are to come within the Operas Consortium and the Daria also. So we will keep uh, an eye on that and probably hear more about that on the future PubMed uh, conferences. Uh, we will finish with this session now. Uh, we have a break now for lunch and we continue at uh, two o'clock. So I hope uh, I will see you there again and let me say goodbye for now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank very much. you. Bye. 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 Bye.